It's Judges 10, verse 6 through 1140. There's quite a story here, so I'm going to get started with that. 10, verse 6. Just uh, somebody pointed this out to me uh, last week. You notice at the beginning of chapter 10, there's somebody named Tola, and there's somebody named Jer, and they each get a couple verses, and... It sounds like these people were good judges, and they get two verses, and then all of the bad judges, they get chapters and chapters worth. So that's just something for you to ponder there. Judges 10.6, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. Because the Israelites forsook the Lord and no longer served him, he became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, who that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years they had oppressed all the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan and Gilead, the land of the Amorites. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. And Israel was in great distress. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, We have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. The Lord replied, When the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, Sidonians, the Amalekites, and Maonites oppressed you, and you cried to me for help, did I not save you from their hands? But you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go and cry to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you from you now that you are in trouble. But the Israelites said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord, and he could bear Israel's misery no longer. When the Ammonites were called to arms and camped in Gilead, the Israelites assembled and camped at Mizpah. The leaders of the people of Gilead said to each other, Whoever will launch the attack against the Ammonites will be the head of all those living in Gilead. Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and settled in the land of Tob, where a group of adventurers gathered around him and followed him. Sometime later, when the Ammonites made war on Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. Come, they said, be our commander so we can fight the Ammonites. Jephthah said to them, Didn't you hate me and drive me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to him, Nevertheless, we are turning to you now. Come with us to fight the Ammonites, and you will be our head over all who live in Gilead. Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, The Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, And the people made him head and commander over them, and he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mitzvah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, What do you have against us that you have attacked our country? And uh, I think I have my map up there next. Okay. So there's going to be a bunch of places that are going to be mentioned here. You can see by the red box, there's Ammon. And uh, the red box is kind of the area that is going to be in question here. But you'll at least have that as a reference point for what's going to be coming up here. So he sends uh, messengers to try to make peace with the Ammonites. So they asked, what do you have against us that you have attacked our country? The king of the Ammonites answered Jephthah's messengers. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they took away my land from the Arnon to the Jabbok all the way to the Jordan. That's 
essentially what the red box is at, up there. Now give it back peaceably. Jephthah sent back messengers to the Ammonite king, saying, this is what Jephthah says, Israel did not take the land of Moab or the land of the Ammonites, but when they came up out of Egypt, Israel went through the desert to the Red Sea and on to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, give us permission to go through your country. But the king of Edom would not listen. They also sent uh, messengers to the king of Moab, and he refused. So Israel stayed at Kadesh. Next they traveled through the desert, skirted the lands of Edom and Moab, so on the east side of those two countries, passed along the eastern side of the country of Moab and camped along the other side of the Arnon. They did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was its border. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who ruled in Heshbon, and said to him, Let us pass through your country to our own place. Sihon, however, did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. He mustered all his men and camped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his men into Israelites' hands, into Israel's hands, and they defeated him. Israel took all the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from the Arnon to the Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. So I don't know if you can see too well, but basically around that red box, there's a shaded area. North of Ammon, there's, there's a shaded area there in, in that red box. And then beneath that, that's the land of Sihon that they conquered. This band of slaves who were just nomads in the desert conquered a nation that was that large. And that was kind of the tipping point for when everybody on the other side of the Jordan started to realize these people are a force to be reckoned with. Anyways, now since the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right do you have to take it over? Will you not take what your God, Shamosh, gives you? Likewise, whatever the Lord, our God, has given us, we will possess. Are you better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years, Israel occupied Hezbon, Aror, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? I have not wronged you, but you are wronging me, doing me wrong by waging war against me. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. The king of Ammon, however, paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent him. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated twenty towns from Aror to the vicinity of Minith, and as far as Abel Karamim. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mitzvah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of the tambourines? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh, my daughter, you have made me miserable and wretched, because I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites, grant me this one request. She said, give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and the girls went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father and he did to her as he had vowed. 
and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite custom that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. Not one of the more pleasant stories you would find in the Bible. But it's here just the same. And somewhere is Christ and God's grace. Let's just kind of go over what happened. This is a lengthy passage. Just uh, to sum it up in a few points here. Israel succumbed to peer pressure and worshipped other gods. As it says in 10 verse 6. They looked at the other nations around them and said, hey, you're worshiping those gods, maybe we'll worship them too. They look good enough for us. And so there's a lengthy list of all the gods that they decided to worship all of a sudden. And then God let the Philistines and Ammonites oppress the Israelites. God essentially said, if you want to worship those gods, then you can serve those countries. If you think it's so great to be an Ammonite and a Philistine, then why don't they rule you instead of me? It only seems fair. So God let the Philistines and Ammonites take over. This is what you want? Then I'll give it to you. But then Israel didn't like that. Israel repented And God showed compassion. I love the way it's worded there in chapter 10. God says, hey, you've forsaken me. You've served other gods. If you want to worship those gods, then go ask those gods to save you. But why are you coming to me? Why all of a sudden? And then they put away their idols. They said, we have sinned. Do to us whatever you think but please deliver us. And once they did that, it says he could bear Israel's misery no longer. So God is a personal God. He, he has a heart. It's not like if you do these certain things, God will give you these certain things. He could bear Israel's misery no longer. And then Jephthah emerges as an outcast but a smart and fierce warrior. He's an outcast. He's not a legitimate child. And so the legitimate children kick him out and say, you're not really part of our family. You don't belong here. Get out of here. And it sounds like he was a pretty fierce guy and a lot of adventurers, it says, more probably like bandits. But it sounded like a lot of other people got around him because he was probably a smart, strong, successful sort of a guy. So he sort of emerges. So then there's an attempt, I'm skipping over a little bit there, there's an attempt to make peace with the Ammonites and that fails. He'd send some messengers to Ammon. Hey, what's our quarrel here? Can we just solve this here, like gentlemen? No, you took our land, and uh, we want it back. Well, we really didn't take your land. We took this land from the Amorites, Sihon. And why didn't you try to take it back when we took it in the first place? We've had it for 300 years now. Why all of a sudden are you claiming it? So that didn't fall through, and the Ammonites broke off talks. Okay? So then Jephthah vows to God that if God gives him victory over Ammon, he would sacrifice anything that is first to meet him at his home. When he returns home, he makes a vow to sacrifice whatever he meets first. Now, just a couple th- questions for you to consider here. Vows are typically made in desperate circumstances. Desperate circumstances. But it says before he made the vow that the Spirit came upon him. 
So the Spirit comes upon him, and yet he still feels desperate enough to make this vow. What's up with that? Did he, did he not realize that the Spirit was with him? Did he feel so desperate against the Ammonites that he had to make just some sort of open-ended vow like that? And what did he expect would exit the door of my house? What, what did he think would come out of the door? How many animals did he have in his house that he would sacrifice? I'm guessing not that many. And even if he did have an animal in mind, if there's people in there, wouldn't you think, hey, maybe I better rephrase my vow so that I don't end up doing something that's terrible here? It's a, it's a baffling thing, his vow there. But it does say the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he defeated the Ammonites. He defeated the Ammonites. So, yeah, okay. So he defeated this powerful enemy that broke off talks of him. His daughter is first to meet him at home. His daughter is the first one to meet him. And Jephthah is now caught between a rock and a hard place. He tears his clothes. That's uh, an expression of the deepest sorrow or the deepest regret, the deepest horror is when you do that. It's typically done when blasphemy occurs. So vows to the Lord must be kept and yet human sacrifice is strictly forbidden. And that's all very plain in the law that God gave to Moses that Jephthah was familiar with. Vows to the Lord must be kept and human sacrifice is strictly forbidden. What is he going to do? How can you get out of that one? So he literally has to choose between sinning in one way or sinning in another way. There's no escape. And then it says, After the two months she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed. And it doesn't say how he fulfilled the vow. It doesn't get specific there. It just said he fulfilled his vow. And there's some people who say that he actually didn't kill her as a sacrifice, but that he presented her to God as a lifelong virgin so that she would like become became a nun or something. Some people say that because the wording is a little open-ended. Although, if that were true... Why wouldn't it say that? It seems like that would be a more pleasant way to end this story than the more horrifying way. So it doesn't, it leaves it kind of open ended because just the thought of doing so is just so horrible. It seems likely that if, if uh, she did become their equivalent of a nun, that it would have said, said that. Because that would have been much more acceptable to have as an ending for your story. But it just says he did to her as he vowed. So it's sort of left to our imagination. Human sacrifice is just such a horrible thing that it's, it's something that we don't even want to talk about. And then going to the cross is something called, it's an offense. Humans being sacrificed is, is an offense. 
Where is Christ and grace here? This is not a nice story. It's not probably one that you heard about in Sunday school. I don't remember learning this one when I was a kid. I learned this one when I was older. And it kind of left my head spinning. What in the world is this about? Well, just some things to point out. Just like Jephthah, you and I, we are hopeless sinners no matter what we do. We're in positions where we cannot avoid sin. We're incapable of doing anything untainted with self-interest and rebellion. We're incapable of doing anything that's not tainted with self-interest and rebellion. We're basically doomed. There's not, it's not like we can choose between something that's sinless and something that's sinful. No, even our best options are tainted with sin. So in Romans 7 it says, So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Even when I'm, I have the best of intentions, evil is still there. And then he concludes that chapter saying, What a wretched man I am. Who is going to rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's our only escape. So, just like Jephthah, you and I are in situations where sin is inescapable. It's a curse. And then there's God. And God doesn't make vows, but he does make promises and covenants. I did some look, had to do some looking around on that one. And I couldn't find anywhere in the Bible where it says God made a vow. There's plenty of places where it says he made promises and established covenants, but the word vow is never used with God. Unlike vows, there is no if in God's promises and covenants. There's no ifs in God's promises and his covenants. When God makes a promise, it's going to happen. When he makes a covenant, he's going to hold up his end of it. So Isaiah 54, 9 and 10. This is God speaking. To me, this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. So even if the mountains fall apart and the whole world caves in, my love is still going to be there. God's covenants don't end. It's not if you obey, it's I'm establishing a covenant with you. And while a vow might be a little bit different than a promise, Jesus Christ is a little bit similar here in that he was also sacrificed because of a promise his father made to Abraham. Jesus Christ went to the cross because of a promise that his father made. In Hebrews, it talks about this quite a bit. He became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. So God made a promise, and Jesus was the sacrifice because of that promise. Like the daughter, Jesus went willingly to fulfill 
the vow or the promise in his case. It went willingly. The daughter didn't try to talk her dad out of it. She realized that a vow has to be kept. Would you just give me two months to mourn? And she could have just taken off. Just give me two months. I'm out of here. I'll go to a different country or something. No, she comes back. So just like that, Jesus went willingly to the cross. There's some people who raise objections to the cross saying, so if God the Father had to sacrifice his son, is, is, that, is that like divine child abuse? Is God sanctioning child abuse by literally beating his own son to hell? And the answer is no. Jesus went willingly. It's not that he didn't want this. He went by his own volition. At any moment, he could have called down 12,000 angels. And the appearance of one angel is enough to make the most solid of Roman soldiers faint. Just one. He could have had 12,000 in an instant at any time. The whole Bible treats vows as life and death matters. Vows are matters of life and death. If vows aren't kept, it's kind of like saying, may God strike me dead if this is not true. Well, Jesus died because of that promise that God had made. Now, we make vows. God makes promises. So, because the Bible treats vows as such important things, our thought for you and me is give thought to your vows. Like marriage, baptism, Professions of faith, or even your signature, those are like vows. Some of them to greater degrees than others, perhaps, but those are vows. Give thought to them. It's not something to be taken lightly. Vows throughout the Bible are treated as matters of life and death. In Ecclesiastes, it says, When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin when you make a vow. And do not protest to the temple messenger, My vow is a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? When we make vows, those are serious things. And that doesn't mean we should never get married, never be baptized, never make profession of faith, or never sign anything. But when we do, we need to take that seriously. And then there's the question of the end. You know, it leaves it a little open-ended. It doesn't say specifically how he fulfilled that vow. So it doesn't give us a specific ending, and yet that's almost not the point. Strangely enough, just like the daughter, we're in a similar situation where it doesn't matter whether we live or die because in either case the Lord is exalted. No matter what kind of life we have, whether it's easy or hard, long or short, no matter what, God is exalted. The vow has been fulfilled. And God is given the glory. In Philippians 1, it says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, 
Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. When I was with Joanne just a couple nights ago, when she got her news about the cancer, she said those words. Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So for you and I, whatever, whatever we may be facing today, this week, the rest of our lives, however long or short they are, Christ will be exalted through Jesus Christ. Or God will be exalted through Jesus Christ, rather. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, may you be exalted. No matter what our lives may hold, we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified. Lord, we pray that we would take our vows seriously. And Lord, that we would fulfill everything that we say that we would do. When we make promises, Lord, we pray that we would fulfill them. Just as you always keep your promises, we pray that we would be the same. And Lord, help us to put all our reliance for our salvation on your Son, Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the promise that you made. And we're so thankful that you fulfilled that promise as difficult, as awful and painful as it was for both you and him. We're very thankful for it. And we pray in his name. Amen.